Hello, I'm Abaya Kolkarni from the Hospital for Sick Children at the University of Toronto, and I'm pleased to speak to you today as part of the CNS Neurosurgery 100 video series. I'll be speaking about endoscopic third ventriculostomy with cori plexus cauterization for infant hydrocephalus, which I think is a really fascinating topic in pediatric neurosurgery. It's a story that really dates back, if you look at it, over 100 years, but then has come into light again more recently in the past couple of decades. And it's a story as well that has global reach um, and is one that we're still learning about and continues to evolve. So if we look back at the history of choroid plexus cauterization as a, as a target for hydrocephalus uh, treatment, it really dates back over 100 years. You have luminaries like Lesplanas and Dandy who describe using what we would consider relatively primitive endoscopic technology to either cauterize or in some cases remove the choroid plexus as a treatment for hydrocephalus. Now they had technological limitations, they had anesthetic limitations, and as a result, their procedures were riddled with high morbidity and, and a fairly high mortality as well. And so when CSF shunts became available in the latter half of the last century, choriplexus cauterization really fell to the wayside as a mainstream treatment for hydrocephalus. Uh, there were still some centers around the world who were doing it, but usually just for niche indications. Now that changed in 2005 when Dr. Ben Worf uh, published his initial experience from treating infants in Uganda. And um, he described a fairly novel technique. It was novel because he was combining endoscopic third ventriculostomy with choriplexus cauterization. It was novel also because he was using a flexible endoscope. And because of that, he was able to do the technique through a single a unilateral coronal entry site that allowed him to then complete the endoscopic third ventriculostomy and then do choriplexus cauterization of the uh, ipsilateral lateral ventricle from the uh, foramen of Monroe all the way through to the body, atrium, and into the temporal horn. But then using the flexible endoscope, create a septum pellucidotomy and then do the same in the contralateral ventricle. And he published his initial results in 2005 in the Journal of Neurosurgery, and the results were actually very promising. Now this is what the technique actually looks like. And so this is a view through a flexible endoscope. Here we're in the uh, left lateral ventricle, uh, cauterizing this uh, pink red choroid plexus using a monopolar cautery. And this is the technique. It's short bursts of uh, monopolar cautery on the choroid plexus, going sequentially along uh, the choroid plexus, along the entire body, atrium, and then into the temporal horn so that you change it from this uh, pink reddish uh, color to a, a blanched color essentially and make it white. And this is what the finished product looks like. So here again on the ipsilateral side, the dilated foramen of Monroe and the blanched choroid plexus on the left lateral ventricle. And then here is the septum pellucidotomy that we created. And if we go over to the contralateral side, you can see the, um, uh, the blanched choroid plexus here from the uh, CPC that we completed on the uh, right lateral ventricle. Now, over the years, uh, we've learned a lot from the Uganda experience. And uh, amongst the, the highlights of what we've learned is that choroid plexus cauterization seems to improve the chances of ETB success in a wide range of etiologies. And this includes things like congenital idiopathic hydrocephalus uh, and congenital aqueductal stenosis. The other important thing is that we've learned that choroplexus cauterization appears to have a dose response effect on ETB success. So that if you do a complete choroplexus cauterization of both lateral ventricles, the chances of ETB success is, is greater than if you only do a partial choroplexus cauterization, which is in turn greater than if you do no choroplexus cauterization. And as you look at the data in total from Sub-Saharan Africa and Uganda specifically, it supported equipoise between uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt and ETV CPC for a range of etiologies, but particularly for post-infectious hydrocephalus, which was the most common type of hydrocephalus seen in Uganda. And that formed the basis for uh, doing a randomized trial of post-infectious hydrocephalus in Uganda, uh, comparing endoscopic third ventriculostomy with choroplexus cauterization to ventricular peritoneal shunt. And these were infants with post-infectious hydrocephalus who were under six months of age. And the primary outcome was a 12-month neurocognitive outcome. And in fact, this randomized trial showed that there was no significant difference in that neurodevelopmental outcome at 12 months. You can also see here from this Kaplan-Meier curve that there was a, a, a marginal um, uh, benefit to time to first treatment failure for ventricular peritoneal shunt, but this was not statistically significant. But we know that the patients that are seen in, in Uganda come with a very different type of profile and etiology than what we would typically see here in North America. And so what is the experience in North America? Well, we can turn to Dr. Worf's experience uh, since having returned to North America and his practice in Boston. 
Um, this is um, his uh, relatively recent series, and it describes 215 patients uh, who underwent ETV-CPC by him, compared to 73 patients who underwent ventriculoperitoneal shunt. Uh, the majority of these patients were under six months of age, and the etiology breakdown was really quite typical of a North American infant hydrocephalus population, including patients with intraventricular hemorrhage or prematurity, myelomeningocele, and aqueductal stenosis. And if you look at the time to first treatment failure graphs that I'm showing you here, um, what you can see is that the, the primary success rate for ETB-CPC in his hands in this population was about 50%. Um, but amongst those 50%, uh, the other 50% who failed, he was able to redo the procedure in a subset of those to salvage uh, uh, another proportion so that the overall treatment uh, success in terms of being treated with endoscopy and, and being free of shunt was 69%. And this compared quite favorably to the primary failure uh, success rate sorry, of ventriculoperitoneal shunt, which was only 36%. Now we also have data from the Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network and the HCRN is a uh, large multi-center consortium uh, across uh, the US and Canada consisting of 14 centers who do collaborative prospective research on um, uh, pediatric hydrocephalus. And if you look at the breakdown of cases that have been done within the Hydrocephalus uh, Clinical Research Network on an annual basis, you can see that Really, our, our first attempt at ETB-CPC was, was back in 2006, shortly after Dr. Worf's paper was published. And then the numbers relatively were low up until 2012 and then took a really large leap in 2013. And that's when a number of surgeons from the Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network went to Uganda to learn the procedure from those who had developed it and who had the most experience in the world and then brought that back to North America. And since 2014, uh, the HCRN has done well over 500 uh, ETV-CPC uh, cases and averaging over 70 uh, ETV-CPC cases a year across the uh, network. And we published our early um, results of ETV-CPC, and this consists of patients who were treated primarily in the years 2014 and 2015, which represented really our very early initial experience with ETV-CPC after having learned the uh, procedure. And you can see that the breakdown of our patient population, again, was fairly typical, um, uh, as you would expect for an infant hydrocephalus population, the vast majority under six months of age uh, with etiology breakdown that was similar to what we saw with Dr. Worf series, including myelomeningocele, interventricular hemorrhage or prematurity, and aqueductal stenosis. The distribution of the ETV success score was expectedly low, as we would, uh, we would uh, expect from an infant population, with the majority having predicted probabilities of success around 30 or 40 percent. This shows that we were really on a learning curve for, for uh, ETV-CPC because the goal of, of the choroid plexus cauterization part of this is to do uh, a complete choroid plexus cauterization of both lateral ventricles or, or practically speaking greater than 90 percent of the visible choroid plexus being cauterized in both lateral ventricles and you can see that we were only able to do that in three quarters of the, uh, the patients um, and that represents the, the learning curve that we, that we had with our early experience. If you look at the complication profile, it's fairly what you'd expect from, uh, from endoscopy in, in infants. The one thing that I think um, bears some noting is the fact that the, the seizure frequency perioperatively was about 5%, which I think is relatively high and is something that one needs to keep an eye on. Most of these, uh, in fact, the vast majority of these are transient um, and, and uh, don't recur, but uh, one certainly worries if there's a, uh, an incidence of increased uh, epilepsy down the road with uh, some of these patients. This was our uh, survival curve for time to first treatment failure for the early experience HCRN results. And you can see that this shows a, uh, a long-term survival of just under 40%, which is certainly not as good as what Dr. Worf had described of, of about 50% with his series in terms of primary treatment failure. Um, but again, I, I think this represents a couple of factors. One is that this represents our early series. So there was a, 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 a technique aspect of the learning curve. But I think there was also a learning curve in terms of identifying the appropriate indications for this procedure and defining who the best patients were to undergo this operation. We did a matched historical comparison to this uh, shunt cohort within the Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network and you can see that really the, the shunt population really did quite a bit better than the ETB-CPC group if all you're looking at here is uh, time to first treatment failure. But since that time, um, really our knowledge and experience with ETV-CPC has evolved, not just within the Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network, but I think really globally. 
Um, and certainly amongst myself and, and the surgeons who, who I uh, collaborate with, I think we all recognize that we are achieving higher rates of complete choroplexis cauterization now that we have much more experience with this. And so further analysis from the HCRN, um, we've revealed, I think, what are potential subgroups of infants who might have a greater chance of ETV CPC success. And so this represents sort of very generally what I would describe as current indications for ETV CPC. And, and I put this in quotes because this is an evolving um, uh, entity here. We, we are continuing to learn more and gain more experience. And I think we're still in the early stages of that. But currently in general, we offer uh, ETV CPC to infants who are under two years of age with hydrocephalus and with age and etiologies as follows. Those patients who have myelomeningocele, uh, but are at least term corrected age or above, those uh, infants who have uh, intraventricular hemorrhage or prematurity, but importantly, who are at least three or six months corrected age or above. And we recognize that's a very rare group of patients who uh, have escaped primary CSF treatment up until being three or six months corrected age. So that's, that's not a common indication. Uh, and for all other etiologies, we generally like them to be uh, over one month corrected age, but uh, more recently, we've been lowering that to term corrected age uh, and above. But in addition to those criteria, we also look very carefully at the preoperative MRI. And we want that to show um, very favorable third ventricular anatomy so that the ETV itself can be done with, uh, with relative facility and, and low complications. And very importantly, we look carefully at the sagittal um, uh, Fiesta images to ensure that there are either no or just very few adhesions in the prepontine cistern. And this is what I'm talking about. Here's a sagittal Fiesta image on, on a patient and if you look at the, uh, the prepontine area, it looks very clean. Um, we don't see um, much in the way of, of, of adhesions in that prepontine space. But here are two patients where um, uh, the prepontine space looks like there is some scarring. Here on the left, you can see that there, and on the right, you can see a more focal area here. So in both these cases, we would really be uh, very reticent to offer ETV CPC because we know this pretends a, a poor chance of ETV CPC success. Uh, and we're still in the process of learning more. So uh, we have uh, received funding for a, a large seven-year multicenter randomized trial to be done within the Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network. Um, this is funded by the National Institutes of Health. And this is a study that will include uh, patients across North America who are under 24 months of age. We will be excluding um, those who have intraventricular hemorrhage or prematurity, but including uh, really all other etiologies. And the primary outcome, much like the randomized trial that was done in Uganda, will be that of the 12-month uh, Bailey scale cognitive outcome score. Um, and in addition to that, though, we will be following patients till age five and with a range of very detailed outcomes. Aside from cognitive outcome, we'll also be looking at quality of life. We'll be looking at detailed uh, MR imaging biomarkers, uh, including um, diffusion imaging. And we will be looking at CSF biomarker outcomes as well. So I think this study, I hope, will provide um, a very detailed, uh, comprehensive look at the treatment of infant hydrocephalus in, in a longitudinal fashion, quite aside from providing very important data comparing ventricular peritoneal shunt to ETV CPC. Currently, we are in the recruiting stages of this and fairly early on in that recruitment process with just over 45 patients randomized to date, but hopefully there'll be uh, some important answers coming from this study in the next several years. Thank you very much.